Section 15 of An Essay Concerning Human Understanding Book 2 by John Locke This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chad Horner Chapter 21 of Power Section 1 The mind, being every day informed by the senses of the alteration of those simple ideas it observes in things without and taking notice how one comes to an end and ceases to be and another begins to exist which was not before reflecting also on what passes within himself and observing a constant change of its ideas sometimes by the impression of outward objects on the senses and sometimes by the determination of its own choice and concluding from what it has so constantly observed to have been that the like changes will for the future be made in the same things by like agents and by the like ways considers in one thing the possibility of having any of its simple ideas changed and in another the possibility of making that change and so comes by that idea which we call power thus we say fire has a power to melt gold i e to destroy the consistency of its insensible parts and consequently its hardness and make it fluid and gold has a power to be melted that the sun has a power to blanch wax and wax a power to be blanched by the sun whereby the yellowness is destroyed and whiteness made to exist in its room in which and the like cases the power we consider is in reference to the change of perceivable ideas for we cannot observe any alteration to be made in or operation upon anything but by the observable change of its sensible ideas nor conceive any alteration to be made but by conceiving a change of some of its ideas section two power thus considered is twofold viz as able to make or able to receive any change the one we may call active the other passive power whether matter be not wholly destitute of active power as its author god is truly above all passive power and whether the intermediate state of created spirits be not that alone which is capable of both active and passive power may be worth consideration i shall not now enter into that inquiry my present business being not to search into the original of power but how we come by the idea of it but since active powers make so great a part of our complex ideas of natural substances as we shall see hereafter and i mention them as such according to common apprehension yet they being not perhaps so truly active powers as our hasty thoughts are apt to represent them i judge it not amiss by this intimation to direct our minds to the consideration of god and spirits for the clearest idea of active powers section three i confess power includes in it some kind of relation a relation to action or change as indeed which of our ideas of what kind soever when attentively considered does not for our ideas of extension duration and number do they not all contain in them a secret relation of the parts figure and motion have something relative in them much more visibly and sensible qualities as colours and smells etc what are they but the powers of different bodies in relation to our perception etc and if considered in the things themselves do they not depend on the bulk figure texture and motion of the parts all which includes some kind of relation in them our idea therefore of power i think may well have a place amongst other simple ideas and be considered as one of them being one of those that make a principal ingredient in our complex ideas of substances as we shall see hereafter have occasion to observe section four we are abundantly furnished with the idea of passive power by almost all sorts of sensible things in most of them we cannot avoid observing their sensible qualities nay their very substances to be in the continual flux and therefore with reason we look on them as liable still to the same change nor have we of active power which is the more proper signification of the word power fewer instances since whatever change is observed the mind must collect a power somewhere able to make that change as well as a possibility in the thing itself to perceive it but yet if we will consider it attentively bodies by our senses do not afford us so clear and distinct an idea of active power as we have from reflection 
on the operations of our minds. For all power relating to action, and there being but two sorts of action, whereof we have any idea, viz. thinking and motion, let us consider whence we have the clearest ideas of the powers which produce these actions. 1. Of thinking body affords us no idea at all. It is only from reflection that we have that. 2. Neither have we from body any idea of the beginning of motion. A body at rest affords us no idea of any act of power to move, and when it is set in motion itself, that motion is rather a passion than an action in it. For when the ball obeys the motion of a billiard stick, it is not any action of the ball, but bare passion. Also, by impulse, it sets another ball in motion that lay in its way. It only communicates the motion it had received from another, and loses in itself so much as the other received which gives us but a very obscure idea of an active power moving in body, whilst we observe it only to transfer, but not produce any motion. For it is but a very obscure idea of power, which reaches not the production of the action, but the continuation of the passion. For so is motion in a body impaled by another, the continuation of the alteration made in it, from rest to motion being little more than an action, than the continuation of the alteration of its figure by the same blow is an action the idea of the beginning of motion we have only from reflection on what passes in ourselves where we find by experience that barely by willing it barely by a thought of the mind we can move the parts of our bodies which were before at rest so that it seems to me we have from the observation of the operation of bodies by our senses but a very imperfect obscure idea of active power since they afford us not any idea in themselves of the power to begin any action either motion or thought but if from the impulse bodies are observed to make one upon another any one thinks he has a clear idea of power it serves as well to my purpose sensation being one of those ways whereby the mind comes by its ideas only i thought it worth while to consider here by the way whether the mind doth not receive its idea of active power clear from reflection on its own operations than it doth from any external sensation section five this at least i think evident that we find in ourselves a power to begin or forbear continue or end several actions of our minds and motions of our bodies barely by a thought of preference of the mind ordering or as it were commanding the doing are not doing such or such a particular action this power which the mind has thus to order the consideration of any idea or the forbearing to consider it or to prefer the motion of any part of the body to its rest and vice versa in any particular instance is that which we call the will the actual exercise of that power by directing any particular action or its forbearance is that which we call volition or willing the forbearance of that action consequent to such order or command of the mind is called voluntary and whatsoever action is performed without such a thought of the mind is called involuntary the power of perception is that which we call the understanding perception which we make the act of the understanding is of three sorts one the perception of ideas in our mind two the perception of the signification of signs three the perception of the connection or repugnancy agreement or disagreement that there is between any of our ideas all these are attributed to the understanding or perceptive power though it be the two latter only that use it allows us to say we understand section six these powers of the mind viz of perceiving and of preferring are usually called by another name and the ordinary way of speaking is that the understanding and will are two faculties of the mind a word proper enough if it be used as all words should be so as not to breed any confusion in men's thoughts by being supposed as i suspect it has been to stand for some real beings in the soul that perform those actions of understanding and volition for when we say the will is the commanding and superior faculty of the soul that it is or is not free that it determines the inferior faculties that it follows the dictates of the understanding etc though these and the like expressions by those that carefully attend to their own ideas 
and conduct their thoughts more by the evidence of things than the sound of words may be understood in a clear and distinct sense yet i suspect i say that this way of speaking of faculties has misled many into a confused notion of so many distinct agents in us which had their several provinces and authorities and did command obey and perform several actions as so many distinct beings which has been no small occasion or wrangling obscurity and uncertainty in questions relating to them section seven every one i think finds in himself a power to begin or forbear continue or put an end to several actions in himself from the consideration of the extent to this power of the mind over the actions of the man which every one finds in himself arise the ideas of liberty and necessity section eight all the actions that we have any idea of reducing themselves as has been said to these two viz thinking and motion so far as a man has power to think or not to think to move or not to move according to the preference or direction of his own mind so far is a man free wherever any performance of forbearance are not equally in a man's power wherever doing or not doing will not equally follow upon the preference of his mind directing it there he is not free though perhaps the action may be voluntary so that the idea of liberty is the idea of a power in any agent to do or forbear any particular action according to the determination or thought of the mind whereby either of them is preferred to the other where either of them is not in the power of the agent to be produced by him according to his volition there he is not at liberty that agent is under necessity so that liberty cannot be where there is no thought no volition no will but there may be thought there may be will there may be volition where there is no liberty a little consideration of an obvious instance or two may make this clear section nine a tennis ball whether in motion by the stroke of a racket or lying still at rest is not by any one taken to be a free agent if we inquire into the reason we shall find it is because we conceive not a tennis ball to think and consequently not to have any volition or preference of motion to rest or vice versa and therefore has not liberty is not a free agent but all is both motion and rest come under our idea of necessary and are so called likewise a man falling into the water a bridge breaking under him has not herein liberty is not a free agent for though he has volition though he prefers is not falling to falling yet the forbearance of that motion not being in his power the stop or cessation of that motion follows not upon his volition and therefore therein he is not free so a man striking himself or his friend by a convulsive motion of his arm which it is not in his power by volition or the direction of his mind to stop or forbear nobody thinks he has in this liberty every one pities him as acting by necessity and constraint section ten again suppose a man be carried whilst fast asleep into a room where is a person he longs to see and speak with and be there locked fast in beyond his power to get out he awakes and is glad to find himself in so desirable company which he stays swillingly in i e prefers his staying to going away i ask is not this stay voluntary i think nobody will doubt it and yet being locked fast in it is evident he is not at liberty not to stay he has not freedom to be gone so that liberty is not an idea belonging to volition or preferring but to the person having the power of doing or forbearing to do according as the mind shall choose or direct our idea of liberty reaches as far as that power and no farther for wherever restraint comes to check that power or compulsion takes away that indifferency of ability on either side to act or to forbear acting their liberty and our motion of it presently ceases section eleven we have instances enough and often more than enough in our own bodies a man's heart beats and the blood circulates which it is not in his power by any thought or volition to stop and therefore in respect to these motions where rest depends not on his choice 
nor would follow the determination of his mind if it should prefer it he is not a free agent convulsive motions agitate his legs so that though he wills it ever so much he cannot by any power of his mind stop their motion as in that odd disease called coria sancti fide but he is perpetually dancing he is not at liberty in his action but under as much necessity of moving as a stone that falls or a tennis ball struck with a racket on the other side a palsy or the stocks hinder his legs from obeying the determination of his mind if it would thereby transfer his body to another place in all these there is want of freedom though the sitting still even of a paralytic whilst he prefers it to a removal is truly voluntary voluntary then is not opposed to necessary but to involuntary for a man may prefer what he can do to what he cannot do the state he is in to its absence or change though necessity has made it in itself unalterable section twelve as it is in the motions of the body so it is in the thoughts of our minds for any one is such that we have power to take it up or lay it by according to the preference of the mind there we are at liberty a waking man being under the necessity of having some ideas constantly in his mind is not at liberty to think or not to think no more than he is at liberty whether his body shall touch any other or no but whether he will remove his contemplation from one idea to another is many times in his choice and then he is in respect of his ideas as much at liberty as he is in respect of bodies he rests on he can at pleasure remove himself from one to another but yet some ideas to the mind like some motions to the body are such as in certain circumstances it cannot avoid nor obtain their absence by the uttermost effort it can use a man on the rack is not at liberty to lay by the idea of pain and divert himself with other contemplations and sometimes a boisterous passion hurries our thoughts as a hurricane does our bodies without leaving us the liberty of thinking on other things which we would rather choose but as soon as the mind regains the power to stop or continue begin or forbear any of these motions of the body without or thoughts within according as it thinks fit to prefer either to the other we then consider the man as a free agent again section thirteen wherever thought is wholly wanting or the power to act or forbear according to the direction of thought there necessity takes place this is an agent capable of volition when the beginning or continuation of any action is contrary to that preference of his mind is called compulsion when the hindering or stopping any action is contrary to his volition it is called restraint agents that have no thought no volition at all are in everything necessary agents section fourteen if this be so as i imagine it is i leave it to be considered whether it may not help to put an end to that long agitated and i think unreasonable because unintelligible question viz whether man's will be free or no for if i mistake not it follows from what i have said that the question itself is altogether improper as it is as insignificant to ask whether man's will be free as to ask whether his sleep be swift or his virtue square liberty being as little applicable to the will as swiftness of motion is to sleep or squareness to virtue every one would laugh at the absurdity of such a question as either of these because it is obvious that the modifications of motion belong not to sleep nor to the difference of figure to virtue and when any one well considers it i think he will as plainly perceive that liberty which is but a power belongs only to agents and cannot be an attribute or modification of the will which is also but a power section fifteen such is the difficulty of explaining and giving clear notions of internal actions by signs that i must here warn my reader that ordering directing choosing preferring etc which i have made use of will not distinctly enough express volition unless he will reflect on what he himself does when he wills for example preferring which seems perhaps best to express the act of volition does it not precisely for though a man would prefer flying to walking yet who can say he ever wills it volition 
it is plain is an act of the mind knowingly exerting that dominion it takes itself to have over any part of the man by employing in it or withholding it from any particular action and what is the will but the faculty to do this and is that faculty anything more in effect than a power the power of the mind to determine its thought to the producing continuing or stopping any action as far as it depends on us for can it be denied that whatever agent has a power to think on its own actions and to prefer their doing or omission either to the other has that faculty called will will then is nothing but such a power liberty on the other side is the power a man has to do or forbear doing any particular action according as its doing or forbearance is the actual preference in the mind which is the same thing as to say according as he himself wills it section sixteen it is plain then that the will is nothing but one power of ability and freedom another power of ability so that to ask whether the will has freedom is to ask whether one power has another power one ability another ability a question at first sight too grossly absurd to make a dispute or need an answer for who is it that sees not that powers belong only to agents and are attributes only of substances and not of powers themselves so that this way of putting the question is whether the will be free is in effect to ask whether the will be a substance an agent or at least to suppose it since freedom can properly be attributed to nothing else if freedom can with any propriety of speech be applied to power or may be attributed to the power that is in the man to produce or forbear producing motion in parts of his body by choice or preference which is that which denominates him free and is freedom itself but if any one should ask whether freedom were free he would be suspected not to understand well what he said and he would be thought to deserve midas's ear who knowing that the rich was a denomination for the possession of riches should demand whether riches themselves were rich section seventeen however the name faculty which men have given to this power called the will and thereby they have been led into a way of talking of the will as acting nay by an appropriation that disguises its true sense serve a little to palliate the absurdity yet the will in truth signifies nothing but a power or ability to prefer or choice and when the will under the name of a faculty is considered as it is barely as an ability to do something the absurdity in saying it is free or not free will easily discover itself for if it be reasonable to suppose and talk of faculties as distinct beings that can act as we do when we say the will orders and the will is free it is fit that we should make a speaking faculty and a walking faculty and a dancing faculty by which those actions are produced which are but several modes of motion as well as we make the will and understanding to be faculties by which the actions of choosing and perceiving are produced which are but several modes of thinking and we may as properly say that it is the singing faculty sings and the dancing faculty dances as that the will chooses or that the understanding conceives or as is usual that the will directs the understanding or the understanding obeys or obeys not the will it being altogether as proper and intelligible to say that the power of speaking directs the power of singing or the power of singing obeys or disobeys the power of speaking section eighteen this way of talking nevertheless has prevailed and as i guess produced great confusion for these being all different powers in the mind or in the man to do several actions he exerts them as he thinks fit but the power to do one action is not operated on by the power of doing another action for the power of thinking operates not on the power of choosing nor the power of choosing on the power of thinking no more than the power of dancing operates on the power of singing or the power of singing on the power of dancing as any one who reflects on it will easily perceive and yet this is it which we say when we thus speak that the will operates on the understanding or the understanding on the will section nineteen i grant that this or that actual thought may be the occasion of volition or exercising the power a man has to choose or the actual choice of the mind the cause of actual thinking on this or that thing as the actual singing of such a tune may be 
the cause of dancing such a dance and the actual dancing of such a dance the occasion of singing such a tune but in all these it is not one power that operates on another but it is the mind that operates and exerts these powers it is the man that does the action it is the agent that has the power or is able to do for powers are relations not agents and that which has the power or not the power to operate is that alone which is or is not free and not the power itself for freedom or not freedom can belong to nothing but what has or has not a power to act section twenty the attributing to faculties that which belongs not to them has given occasion to this way of talking but the introducing into discourses concerning the mind with the name of faculties a notion of their operating has i suppose as little advanced our knowledge in that part of ourselves as the great use and mention of the like invention of faculties in the operations of the body has helped us in the knowledge of physic not that i deny there are faculties both in the body and mind they both of them have their powers of operating else neither the one nor the other could operate for nothing can operate that is not able to operate and that is not able to operate that has no power to operate nor do i deny that those words and the like are to have their place in the common use of languages that have made them current it looks like too much affectation wholly to lay them by and philosophy itself though it likes not a gaudy dress yet when it appears in public must have so much complacency as to be clothed in the ordinary fashion and language of the country so far as it can consist with truth and perspicuity but the fault has been that faculties have been spoken of and represented as so many distinct agents for it being asked what it was that digested the meat in our stomachs it was a ready and very satisfactory answer to say that it was the digestive faculty what was it that made anything come out of the body the expulsive faculty what moved the motive faculty and so in the mind the intellectual faculty or the understanding understood and the elective faculty or the will willed or commanded this is in short to say that the ability to digest digested and the ability to move moved and the ability to understand understood for faculty ability and power i think are but different names of the same things which ways of speaking when put into more intelligible words will i think amount to thus much that digestion is performed by something that is able to digest motion by something able to move and understanding by something able to understand and in truth it would be very strange if it should be otherwise as strange as it would be for a man to be free without being able to be free end of section fifteen recording by chad horner intimation of an essay concerning human understanding